Jesse alumnus, customer to Mr. Shijoki Ijimura, uh, also called CJ Ijimura. And uh, uh, tonight he's going to discuss a very interesting and, uh, and, and the trending topic, which is the IIoT, uh, the whole gamut from exploration uh, to uh, drilling to production. Uh, for all of you who don't know what I, I, IIoT is, I know like most of you actually know, but like, I, I don't want you to judge me, I might call me stupid, but like it's, uh, after like, I did my search, because I never knew like what the first I stands for, and then I realized like it's the industrial internet of things. Uh, for uh, just a little about Mr. CJ, uh, he is a hybrid engineer. Uh, he's a second uh, generation uh, professional in the gas industry, uh, with experience on both onshore and offshore assets. Uh, he works for ExxonMobil, uh, Air Energy, and uh, world class Scottish uh, engineering management consulting company. And now he works for Hybrid Data Solutions as a principal scientist and engineer where they uh, search the capabilities of artificial intelligence and uh, big data and solving real world complex problems. What excitement can I have a big round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. I mean, but that was too much. <laughs> I think you would have just, you know, condensed the whole world, world together. Uh, it was short already. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all good. Thanks, guys. I really, I want to say thank you all for coming around, you know. Um, this is what I'm passionate about talking about, you know. It's something you can wake me up any minute. I, you know, enjoy talking about it. But again, I can't be talking about it alone, right? <laughs> if there's no one here to, like, you know, come and listen to it, you know, if that, there's no need, you know, coming to talk about it. So I want to say thank you all for coming, you know, just even to, yeah, listen to what I have to say. Um, so, like... Ahmed alluded, I'm going to be talking about um, IIoT. So IIoT, it's the same thing as Internet of Things technology. But for engineers like me and you, right, we more... Uh, so before I continue, what are the disciplines that we have here? Who are like, do we have like other engineers be, besides petroleum engineers here? Oh, okay. What, what, what type of engineering are you? Electrical. Electrical. How about you? Environmental. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Great, 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 great. I'm, I, w I mean, my background was electrical, so yeah, yeah. And again, like what I'm going to be sharing today covers all the engineering, you know. And yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions you want me to answer. So pretty much I'll be talking about like IOT as it applies to the oil and gas industry. And uh, like Ahmed talked about, I'll be talking about the whole spectrum. Really, with this short amount of time, I can't really cover the whole spectrum. But I tried as much as possible to keep, hit like the key highlights of each and every one of these oil and gas processes. Um, first of all, from exploration, to drilling, to production, and to facilities. Uh, facility as well, I added facility <laughs> as well. Um, so, for this talk, right, the great thing is, you know, we are just a good bunch, right? So I wanted to look more interactive. I wouldn't just be the only one talking, right? I want you all to like, you know, I'm going to ask you guys some questions to see what you guys think about. Then, you know, kind of, you know, yeah, make it more interactive. So I, I wouldn't be the only one talking, okay? <laughs> um, so a little bit about me. I may said it all. I... Currently work with hybrid data. I'm a principal engineer and scientist there. I graduated from USC with my master's in petroleum engineering. <laughs> I have my bachelor's, like I alluded earlier, in electrical engineering. However, before I started my master's at USC in petroleum engineering, I started my master's in advanced control systems and robotics engineering. Well, I did that for like one quarter in a school called Cal Poly Pomona, you know, not so far away from here, before I switched to USC. Uh, the reason being that I have worked like as a reservoir engineer with ExxonMobil for a, a long time. And yeah, I love electrical by default, but again, to consolidate on my experience lines, I mean, I felt like, you know, again, I mean, the based on how Dr. Shaggy spoke to me, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the petroleum engineering was just like, you know, the best thing for me. 
Um, I have like my rich expertise, domain expertise in reservoir and production engineering and within the oil and gas space. Um, that's a little bit about me. So for our talk today, this is just a preview of like what the outline will be about. So first of all, I'll talk to you guys about what you know the objectives of this talk will be about. Then break down like the oil and gas IoT processes. So the processes I'm talking about like the exploration to the drilling to the production to the facility, right? So what happens in IoT is that the key three things you, you're doing, either you're, you're, you're trying to monitor on the equipment or you're trying to record data of the equipment. Again, you want to control the equipment, right? Um, you, at the end of the day, too, you want to improve the processes from those equipment. So those are like the three key things. So I will hit on those three key functions that IoT adds to any oil and gas equipment and processes. Then I'm going to talk about like the production grade design and cost considerations. Like what, I mean, if you want to design an IoT system, what would you consider? What cost? I mean, what would be your cost considerations? What would be your design consideration? However, I, I made it like for the design and cost considerations, I try to delve more about like the, the software side of it. I believe like we all as engineers, we play so much with hardware, right? But again, like the software side of it is even like the more, of more paramount interest than, the hardware is very important, but the software side of it is what makes up, I mean like, makes sure you be able to optimize whatever process you want to optimize. And I'll go forward to like state of the art way of now it's not just only transmitting data between, I mean, cloud servers. Now you want to be able to like run your algorithms. You want to be able to like do quick processing of your data. You want to be able to like say, oh, you want to start sending them out of your data in your local device before you send it to the cloud. So I'll talk about edge computing. Then very important thing, security. So I'll talk about security. Um, then. I'll move into talking about intelligence, which really, regardless of everything, the intelligence part in IoT is what makes it like really, really like a game changer. You being able to like integrate and ingrain intelligence into the um, equipment. And finally, I'll conclude. However, before I start, I'd like to pass this across to you guys. So this is just like a, this is two devices you can see, this is like Raspberry Pi um, devices, then this is like, just like a button, IoT button device, right? So when I walk you guys through the presentation, you guys can just be taking a look at, you know, all these devices, then I'll, I'll tell you guys what this means, you know, as I walk through the presentation. So just take a look at each and every one of them, just pass it across. So, like I talked about, the objectives for this talk is basically to, I mean, for you guys to understand like production grade IoT technology and opportunities that are within the oil and gas industry. What's IoT? Pretty much what an IoT is, is just you are using like network connected devices, right, to transmit information. But again, there are two sides to it. Either that the network component is embedded in the device or that the network component is separate on its own. If you see my illustrations, the two chats I have on the left and the right, so the configuration one is if you have the network component separate. Why the configuration two if, if you have the network component embedded in your device? So if you go to, as the device comes true to you, the two Raspberry Pis could be like the configuration one, the gateway here, right? The red guy sitting in the middle. Later on, I'll tell you why I live early red. Then the other configuration two could be like the, the IoT button, which is more like the embedded device. So it has like <coughs> communication in it. So if, if you want to push like data to the cloud with the embedded body, you don't need like a gateway 
connect that device to push the data to the cloud. So like I talked about, I wanted to drive us through from exploration to drilling to production to facilities. Um, does anyone understand by me naming it from exploration to drilling to production to facilities? Do you, do you all understand why I did that? To, to show how IoT can affect like, uh, like different parts of petroleum, starting from the very beginning until the... Okay, okay, that's true, that's right, that's right, that's right. Connection. What? So, even part of the industry actually have an interconnection between... So, what is the inspiration of like, production of big facility and so on? Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely, that's right. To monitor and control. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, well, you all are all right. However, well, like, why I put it that way is that, okay, let's say now, right, before we go, the, at the final goal, right, in the offshore sector is for us to, what, safely produce hydrocarbons, right, and send it through the pump where we get paid, right? And what happens, the series of processes that go about is that first of all, right, you have, like, I mean, you have like your different ships, right, being sent to like shoot all the different, I mean, seismic surveys, right? So that starts off with exploration, right? Then from exploration, you move into drilling, right? You first of all drill like a wildcat well before you drill the actual well, right? So from drilling, you move into what? Producing the well, completing and producing the well, right? Then finally, you now go to what? Now you're producing the well, you pass it through the different facilities, right? Where it gets to the crude transfer media and some, you know, handshake is being done, right? So that's kind of like the way I, you know, place this. So I'll start off first with exploration. So let's say, for example, we want to generate 3D image of a target reservoir or a target prospect, right? We really, like, okay, now we want to, we don't know where, whether there's oil in this, you know, particular location, right? We want to generate the 3D image so that our geoscientists, our geophysicists could analyze our seismic data and tell us, oh, where there's the likelihood of hydrocarbon quantity, right? So some kind of devices that are being used in doing something like that could be like your geophones and your hydrophones to monitor and record the response you get from the sound waves that reflect from the end crushed, right? Then for control, like your vibration trucks, right? The, the trucks that generate that sound wave. Your air guns, if you're like in the marine environment, right? So those are like the equipment you can control, right? Um, what would you want to improve? You want to what, estimate the likelihood of commercial hydrocarbon quantity, right? So by doing, by if you see this chain of events, you see that really an IoT system, an IoT enabled um, exploration system can really yield so much value and to be honest with you this is has has always been done before IOT came into place right but I think the part that has not always been done really is the improving part so I mean shooting off geo, using geophones to record like signal seismic signals or hydrophones it, it has always been done using those vibration trucks I mean control systems, it has always been done. But uh, what happens is whenever that huge amount of data is being shot or extracted, it goes to another department that goes about pre-processing the data, right? Which, if you have an IoT system, I mean, you're connecting, you're pushing all this data to the cloud, you can have the capability of extracting, you know, to really decide on which area, which particular, even decide on which particular area to shoot multiple shots of you know your um, of your seismic survey so that's for exploration so now since we've acquired let's say we've now we now see where the prospect is at right and we've drilled like a wildcat well now we want to drill a well so if we want to drill a well so the typical type of tax I mean you want to safely heat where your target prospect is in drilling, most times they want to 
be able to hit it as quickly as possible, safely too, safely and as quickly as possible and cost effectively. What would you want to monitor? You want to monitor your measurement while drilling the equipment, right? Those equipment that obtain your drilling parameters for you. What would you like to control? You want to control something like your top drive system, right? Um, what would you like to improve? You want to prevent any form of like key casing, balloon effect, any form of issues or whatever, because that's going to not allow you to accomplish the tax of, tax of drilling quickly and cost effectively. So this just gives you a sense of feel like currently in the drilling industry, right, all this, I mean like the monitoring and the control part, they're all in place, right? And even there are, I mean, like some drilling rigs that do this now too as well. You know, but again, it gives you a sense of feel like it's not, it's still as its, as its infancy. So there's still like a plethora and so much of opportunity for us to use I IoT to um, gain from the drilling process. So now after we drill the well, we obviously want to complete it and produce it. Right. So, for instance, after you drill and produce, after you drill and complete the well, you want to be able to produce at the maximum efficient rate. You want to make sure like there's no any form of like water coating, gas coating, and all that. Right. What would you want to monitor? Or you want to build like your reservoir simulation model? You want to monitor for someone like me that as a as an RE guy, I like permanent downhole gauges because they give me like pressure data for me to build my model, right? You want to be able to monitor and record the pressure for your permanent downhole gauges or your flow line rates, right? right? Then what would you want to control? The production engineer doesn't want anything to happen whenever there's like a failure, right, to his, I mean, to his wellhead. So he wants to be sure that he can control his surface control, um, subsurface valve. So those are like equipments that IIoT can be able to, I mean, remotely, you don't even really need to like send the operations guys out there on the field to go, you know, and control those equipment. Some people, are, I mean, some companies already, right, they have that implemented. But oftentimes they're always like, I mean, one part is automated, one part is not, right? But with an IIoT system, the monitoring, the controlling, then more importantly, the improving. So improving now with an IoT system now, you can also be able to determine what's your optimum choke that you can produce as well to get you know the maximum efficient rate possible. What at what pressure, at what flow rate. Um, so now we've produced the well, the next thing we want to flow it through our facilities, right? So Flowing it through our facilities, our facilities might be that they've been, been installed for like um, 20 years, 30 years, you know. So now the tax might be you want to enhance your facilities, equipment to your full life, so you want to expand it. So what are the type of, I mean, equipment, what type of equipment do you think that, do you think that whenever, when you monitor and record, you could be able to, um, achieve that goal of expanding your facilities, equipment, your full life, something like your pipeline, your compressors. What would you want to control? You want to control something like your valves, your main online pumps. What would you want to improve? You want to improve, increase your mean time between failure. You want to minimize any form of scheduled and unscheduled downtime within your facility to be able to expand the equipment, useful life in your facility. <coughs> so. If you, based on, I mean, breaking down those four different areas, you see how you can integrate each and every one of this I IoT processes for each and every one of those um, petroleum engineering disciplines. <laughs> so now we... What's the now, question again? Was that a question? Huh? There was was that a question? No, not your question. Oh, okay. That wasn't a question. <laughs> I was just so. That's okay. So now that we've you know we've been able to see that hey throughout the exploration, um, drilling, production, facility, <coughs> and bear in mind I didn't really name all the different equipments that are in all these different disciplines, but just little equipment. But now that we've seen like, hey, an IoT system can do you know all this for us. 
So what next? Before you go meet your manager, hey, I want you to you know implement an IoT system. He's gonna say, I mean, what's what's it gonna cost me, right? What's it gonna cost us? And he also asks you, okay, if it costs us this, how much are we gonna make from it? <coughs> so this is more or less um, telling you more about what the design and cost considerations are. Like I alluded earlier, I plan not to go the engineering way of talking about the hardware cost consideration. So I try to um, really talk more about the software considerations. So the, for the design and cost considerations, there are two currently like state of the art designing of IIoT system. One of the architectures being used is called the serverless computing. Then the second one, which I'll talk to next, is called the microservices um, or service-oriented service architecture. So serverless computing is just almost like a model, like just like now you want to move from point A to B. So now in LA, right, you know, we all, some people don't have a car. They only just, hey, Uber, come pick me up. Right? You only pay for when, I mean, Uber picks you up. So it's almost like similar type of module, but in the software world, right? So you only pay for the services you use. In essence, so if you want to deploy like an IoT solution, you um, pay for like your database and your storage set service. So you want to store the data, the data, the telemetry data that has been transmitted from your IoT device, right? Now your application logic that you want to use in monitoring, controlling, ingraining intelligence, you, they call it functions as a service. So you also pay for just running the functions. Versus, or you want to you know, get like a whole, an entire server, right? Then now another part is what after you've extracted all this data, you've written all the different application logics, right? Now you want to manage your device how you want to be able to, oh, whenever I hear about like, hey, something trips up, I can just query my data warehouse or my data lake and it tells me which device failed, right? One, some of the great thing about using this module, this module of design of IoT system is that there are little or no really upfront investment. Some of the advantages is one is, let's say in our, right, um, you're, you, just, you just have like a small company or you want to test and see, okay, do we think, and we, I mean, we need an IoT device in our organization for us to be successful. You can say, okay, let's pick a bunch of like 10 devices and use the serverless approach. So in essence, whenever you're not transmitting so much data, this is a good module for you to I mean, consider designing your IoT system. For managers, they love this type of module because now you're not thinking about anything, any capex cost. It's all about your operating cost, right? And the great thing again is that it's fast, faster time for you to market, for you to test and see what, how valuable it is, right? But then again, the disadvantage is about some of this type of technique is when it now comes to at the end of the day, right? Depending on the value of the data you want to extract from your IoT system, oftentimes that not, you want to be able to acquire a good amount of telemetry data from your IoT devices. So this type of module is being constrained. Because if you remember what I said, the functions as a service is just like you're being assigned like a little kernel of your, of like, a machine scanner for you to run your function. So you're being limited by memory, you're being limited by even like your system calls. So most most times like the bandwidth, they also try to, the cloud providers, pr providers, they also try to make it you know attractive for their business as well. They don't give you all the bandwidth you need. They don't give you all the memory you need. So oh, when you see like that doesn't work for you, then you have to think about, you know, spinning up a server and run those algorithms and those codes. Another thing again is that if you go about extracting or 
transmitting like more amount of data, your cost will be more, it's going to be more larger, right? So those are like the design and cost considerations for using like the serverless architecture. The next architecture I talked about was the microservices or the service oriented architecture. So pretty much this is another state of the art type of architecture of deploying um, IoT systems. This is like you package all your, be your database, database part in one, what they call like a container. So you package like your database part, your application logic part, your, um, your IoT device management part, all are separate logics. Um, some of the popular tools we use in doing such is what they call like a Docker Compose and Kubernetes. The great thing about going with this type of approach is like especially for like IoT devices, right? And software in general. Oftentimes right, we do get like updates from iPhone, right? For you to update your iOS, right? And the truth is that for IoT systems, constantly, you know, things are going to be changed, right? Your security might be compromised at one point or the other, and you want to update them. So those, those are like the areas where such kind of, this type of architecture shines. But again, you have like a high upfront investment. The advantage is too about this type of, um, using this type of architecture is that you can be able to handle like big data workloads. You can be able to like whatever algorithms you want to deploy on the cloud, you can deploy it. And I mean, it's going to be operating like efficiently. Again, like I alluded, you can deploy like updates to your, all your devices easily. And another great thing again is that, let's say now, right, you have like, you're a big company, let's say like ExxonMobil, you have a subsidiary here in, um, in the US, subsidiary here in um, Australia, right? You can actually deploy updates to those two subsidiaries at a go. Then again, you can deploy, package the same application you have in the US, independent of the cloud resources being used in the US here, and package the same application and also deploy it somewhere close to, I mean, any data center or any like cloud provider close to Australia. So what that does for you, like, Previous traditional way of like, oh, the headquarters, right, will deploy the whole solution. But with this kind of architecture, you can accomplish that. So, in essence, you reduce like the network bandwidth, right, to achieve such. Uh, but the disadvantage is whatever is good, there's always going to be a disadvantage. So, the disadvantage is about using such kind of architecture is that you have to now manage your <coughs> and maintain yeah. your servers. Um, your operational expenses was, was skyrocket because you need people admin expenses. Again, longer time to market. Um, all in all, I'll leave you all to decide which might be the best design and cost consideration to go with. But both of them are really great. But in my opinion, anyone that wants to delve into IIoT, the serverless architecture, it's a more easier and smoother route to start um, dabbling into IoT. Now we've talked about this different the connections, the you know the connection. We talked about a lot of like the communication part, sending and passing data from here and there, right? So really, where most times, often than not, wherever there's a security breaches, when you want to transmit information, right? So now you see like two people walking, right? How can you eavesdrop into what they are saying? You have to what, you know, get, not necessarily, you know, be with them, but just be around them, right? So the communication links are where you, I mean, like, you get security pro more. And back to the configuration I showed up earlier, right? You, the middle guy, the gateway, that's where the, bunch of the communication takes place. And that's why I put it in red, because that's like where it's like highly sensitive and that's where like I mean a lot of like breaches and security breaches could be could come up. But in the IoT world, 
there are certain measures already in place to be able to counter such breaches. So now you want to um, deploy IoT system for certain devices. For each of the devices, they generate what they call key pairs. They have what they call the private key pairs and the public key pairs. The public key pairs is mostly used for data encryption and transmitting the data you want to exchange. So it's almost like now I, who, who uses bit, who, who does like Bitcoin or crypto trading? Okay, great. So you have like your public key, right, and your private key. No difference. So your private key, you don't expose it, right? So your public key is what they could use in transmitting the funds for you. So your, there has to be handshake between like, I mean, your private key has to decrypt what your public key is accepting. So it's still the same technology, not in different. So in IoT system, your devices, each of your devices, no matter how small they are, they all have those two keys. And before they could talk together with either the gateway, that's with the communication system, or with the cloud, the cloud has to what, have their handshake with the device it wants to talk to. Already established, already initialized before they can transmit data. So, um, that's what goes on with um, the security bar. Then again, some other areas in terms of security is you also be you'll be logging whatever requests or whatever data that is being transmitted because you want to know who is sending it. Paraventure, there is any like any security breach, you know, like oh wherever the problems are. So those are like some of the um, steps you take in terms of security. Then also you define like security policies, security rules. Um, for edge computation, in terms of edge computation, excuse me. Excuse me guys. So I, I missed like a slide. Yeah, I missed the slide because I should there should be something on edge computation. Excuse me, guys. We had it in the very beginning, I think. Something can uh, edge computation. Ah, uh, yeah, because there should be edge computation up before the security part. Uh, just give me one second, please. I think it's time. Because, I mean, I, if, I need to explain the edge computation so you understand why, I mean, yeah, why it's out there on the security. It's not on this slide, but I mean, yeah. it's on the old slide, but I, I, need, I need you guys to, you know, really, uh, I mean, understand this before I, you know, go into the security part. And as a matter of fact, this is like a very important part. So now, all right, um, edge computation. Anyone knows what edge computation is? Like supercomputers? about that. <laughs> you know what edge computation is? 
Okay, so edge computation is simply that you are locally um, interchanging resources between your local gateway device um. and whatever device that is there locally. So what happens is what you are like almost like using your local device as the cloud. So you're reducing like workload the cloud would have been doing on the edge the on the gateway devices. So what that does for you is that in the edge in the um, gateway devices you can be able to deploy your algorithms locally. So what you're doing is what you're reducing the amount of bandwidth that it takes for you to send your data to the cloud and whatever logic you have in the cloud to respond back and I mean instruct your device of what to do and what not to do, right? So that's where edge computation is very, very like important. But um, so some of the things again you can get from edge computation is data processing. So say you want to instead of like sending your data to the cloud and pre-processing it, you can process it at the edge. Again, you can say, oh, okay, I want it to be that after every hour, push this data to the cloud for me. Those kind of um, applications are really good in like remote environments where you don't have like strong network or strong signal. So you can say, oh, okay, um, hold this amount of data for me, right? I'm be later on push it to that. But another very important thing it does is deploying your algorithms on the edge. Because really that's what makes IoT like, I mean, IoT a game changer. And that's why we could say, okay, now we want to, if we can say, we want to use an IoT system for critical equipment, critical devices. You hear about like the self-driving cars. So the self-driving cars you hear about, their algorithms, their code, their logics are all being run on the edge. Because it's critical. I mean, the fun is that, I mean, the cloud service is great, but sometimes you get to so many places that, you know, the network out there is pretty spotty. So you need to, I mean, have it like in the edge. So why I wouldn't talk about this was when we talk more about the security part, right? Because in the security part, where we experience like um, breaches are in the communication part. And when I started up initially, I was talking just about the gateway being like the um, kind of communication hub, right? So now, when you introduce the edge computation, it's almost like, well, you introduce another new layer of, you know, someone there, you know, sniff and sniff into like whatever package you're sending, right? So for your edge <coughs> devices, you also have to what now create like, like you did for the devices, like creating like private and public keys for them, so that whatever equipment they are talking to, they know like, oh, okay, this is the right edge device. As a matter of fact, in your gateway device, you can have like four or five different edge kernels, kernels that are talking to like maybe 20 group of devices. One of the kernel in that same gateway device might be talking to like 20 group of devices and another one will be talking to another 20 group of devices. So for the edge computation, you need to like design, you define like what you, your users and your group. Uh, and also you need to like generate your associated certificate and keys. In that way, you'll be able to like prevent security breaches. But the truth is this, um, these attackers are really smart. And it never ends there. They still figure another way to attack your IoT de um, devices and your IoT network. So one of the most very prevalent attack is what, what is in, is being called distributed denial of service. So it's pretty much like now you have, let's say the, the, the guy on the blue is your device. So one or the, the attacker spins up like 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 or 500 different devices with different IPs talking to that your device. Really, what he's trying to do is uh, he doesn't want your device to function. He wants your the your device server to break down, and they won't be able to 
do any form of um, any IoT or IoT operations. But currently, there are sets of, I mean, artificial intelligence algorithms that prevent such kind of attack from being, I mean, it could, it could, the attacks could come into fruition once, or if you have a very robust artificial intelligence algorithm, it will be able to eliminate whatever attack, it, I mean, that comes in. So the most important part is the intelligence part, and to be honest, I believe that's where we as engineers, we shine a lot. We monitoring or recording or controlling, those are still, I mean, there are still opportunities there, but as an engineer, you know what processes go on. You know the different variables. So ingraining the intelligence in the IoT system is a very, very is the important part, right? So the different kind of um, the different algorithms you could use in ingraining intelligence into your IoT system is could be something like your supervised learning algorithms, your semi-supervised learning algorithms, or your unsupervised learning algorithms, and really depending on how you want to. Um, write your algorithms, depending on what intelligence you want to ingrain, depending on what you want to um, achieve. Like the four, this, expo the exploration, the drilling, the production and the facility um, improvement of processes that I mentioned, you can all write an algorithm, be it supervised, be it semi-supervised, be it unsupervised learning algorithms that could be able to like improve whatever processes you want. I try as much as possible not to be specific on which algorithms because the, the, the thing that happens is depending on the algorithms really don't play the majority of the role of how much um, accuracy you get. What plays most important role is in your data and how you understand the process. And that's where you as maybe as a domain expert, expert, right? You understand what are the different properties, what are the different variables, right? That will make my algorithm. The algorithm doesn't play a role. And depending on whoever, I may say, oh, I want to build my algorithm for my IoT solution, starting with an unsupervised learning algorithm, then pipe it into like a supervised learning algorithm. Or I could say, oh, I want to start off with supervised learning algorithm and you know, make it semi-supervised. So different ways you can you know, orchestrate your algorithm. So I didn't uh, bother like, you know, hitting on all that. So finally, there's like a lot of opportunity as we can see based on I mean, all what I said. Even in just monitoring and control, there's like a lot of opportunities for engineers. But for me, I always want to believe that, you know, we all, as, I feel the monitoring and the control part, I mean, the logic for monitoring and control, like the code base is just little snippets of code. You don't have to like write algorithms for it really, right? So you're just saying, oh, I mean, while whatever is on, right? While well, your device is on, send me this data. Or, oh, oh, if this gets to this threshold, shut it off, turn it on. Those are like, you know, just straightforward. So I, 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 I want us to look not just only on the monitoring and control aspect, but again, beyond that, the optimizing the process, which we all understand better. And like I alluded, the algorithms play some role, but not as much as the guy that understands the process, the engineer that understands the process, what it takes to um, be able to yeah, um, increase the accuracy of the algorithm. And another thing that I see that will be happening more often, um, like back then, like engineers make most of their decisions based off data. But now, you will see like there are going to be like more, so many more engineers that need to like make decisions of the, I mean, equipment data. And if we're not able to understand like how we can extract those data, 
how we can process them, how we could um, build the algorithms to optimize the process. It is going to be really tough. I mean, it will be tough because right now, even currently, we have shortage of talents that could do that in the engineering world. <coughs> The great thing again about whatever skill set, whatever IoT skill sets, say we are going, doing like your masters, you have like different areas you specialize. You might say you want to specialize in production. You might say you want to specialize in drilling, in facilities, or in geoscience technologies, right? But the great thing is that whatever IoT, IoT skills or techniques that you pick up, they're all transferable. So if you I mean, if you see the way me breaking down the exploration part, the drilling part, the production <coughs> part, the facility part, you see like whatever skill sets, monitoring and control, you're improving a process, right? It's still the same monitor, control, record, improve a process. So it's transferable, even beyond the oil and gas industry, you know. Um, another thing again I see is that I, I, I want it also to be cognizant of is that I also see that now we're not going to be working with only small data sets because <coughs> at some point, right, and in terms of like you, in terms of like the opportunities now available, those guys that were earlier in the industry. I mean, like people that started working in the industry earlier, when, whenever you just sink in a well, you produce like, you know, 200 barrel oil well. Now you don't get that. If you produce 50 barrels, that's really like, really great, great, right? So gradually from 50 barrels now, maybe come like in two years or three years, it's going to be whoever comes up with five barrels of oil, right? But the truth is that, that you getting that five barrels of oil wouldn't be as easy as or you just look at a bunch of, you know, five wells or ten well data. You need to actually dig to find, oh, okay, out of like this 1,000 wells or 50 or 100 or whatever amount of wells, which of them can I extract the most amount of hydrocarbon from? That's all from me. And I welcome your questions. Thank you. Sure. Do you do, do you do smart oil field technologies? I didn't do smart oil field technology. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because what you're explaining is pretty much what smart oil field technology is going, is going towards, to, right? So okay. that was my question. Okay. That's a good question. I, I didn't do it. Yeah, but. Sure. So I have a question on the application of IoT and AI in general. Yeah. So. Most of the application you mentioned and most of the, the one that I have read yeah. in the oil and gas industry about machine learning and AI. Yeah. I feel like most of the application focus on that the problem that has a lot of data and yeah. a lot of things related to mechanical, like what is the best joke, what is the best uh, flow rate or whatever. Mm -hmm. How about I have the AI and the machine learning have they have application in the more in the realm that has more physics? physical process based like numerical modeling and okay. things like that. Yeah. Do they have application on those? There are. There are applications on those. Um, a lot of applications. So I'm a reservoir guy. I like reservoir <laughs> stuff. But if you notice that it talks too much reservoir. So yeah, I mean like as a reservoir engineer, right, you want to build your models. So one great thing about AI and machine learning is, you know, it depends on how you want to use it. So now uh, as a reservoir engineer, I want to build my modules, so I get my PVD data, right? So I come maybe take it through like different um, experiments, right? I take it through whatever tools they have, and say, okay, this is what my my maybe my bubble point pressure versus my solution dual curve will be, right? But the truth is that you can amplify that earlier process, right? So say you can say in a field if they have like 50 PVT data samples versus you just use one PVT data sample. You can take the 50 of them and be able to extrapolate, okay, which out of this 50 PVT data samples, right, which one gives me, you know, the best representation of what my reservoir will be, right? Right. 
but that doesn't mean like you're done with your model, right? But that's what you feed into your numerical simulation model, right? You understand me? Mm -hmm. So now you're done, you're done with the PVD part, right? So now you say, hey, okay, I'm looking for like analogous wells, right? Not the one of, oh, I come, I say, what's their <laughs> geologic um, features, right? What is the bubble point pressure? What's the reservoir depth, right? What was the solution geo from old access database or old, you feel me? So now you can say, oh, okay, now give me the production data. I want to be able to get the production profile for a particular, let's say, a zone, right? A particular zone or a particular pattern, right? You take like 50 wells in that pattern, their production, their actual dynamic data, right? And what? You can be able to decompress it and say, hey, out of this 50 wells with this numerous amount of features, I decompress it into just this little, you know, amount of feature sets and feed it into your module, right? That way you can history much better, you know? So, but the way, if you see it, it's not like it's like you're building like an AI module for the whole reservoir, right? But those little steps you take as a <coughs> reservoir in there, right? You're more or less like what? Amplifying it, I mean, it's being more realistic. Right. Yeah, just a comment to follow on that. So like most of us as a reservoir engineer has work in the bottles that have little data. So like we when we exploring wells or exploring where we want to drill it. Yeah. Usually what we have is limited data. Mm -hmm. So what I'm I guess what I'm hoping that the AI can go for us is with that limited data, they can actually learn some pattern behavior and then they expand that and then we have more data to constrain the model later on. That's the hope. Yeah. That's what it could do. <laughs> That's what it could do. And and Really, it's not like, well, you're still going to be building your modules, but now it's like for all those different workflows, you're more or less what? I mean, making it more realistic than or blinded approach of, okay, I see this ends, I mean, the bandwidth of the pressure is from this to this, right? You now say, okay, I'm just going to do like a gold seek or something and populate those values. Yeah. So, so oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It's okay. That's so I, I wanted to ask, uh, the amount of data which comes to our hands these days, it's like enormous, it's at least like 100 million times than if we compare it with, um, with the past. So how do engineers manage to work with this data and find, uh, find some decision solutions for this data if, if that's so much? I mean, the, the data is so big right now. Do we implement some algorithms which optimize it, or what is the way of dealing with this data? To be honest with you, I mean, in my own opinion, the engineers have to start working now. <laughs> start working? They have to start working now. I mean, they have to, like, you know, be able to um, dig the whole data. Because that's where you see, like, opportunities. I mean, management wants you to tell, give them opportunities that they don't pay more money for. Previously, engineering was more like, I mean, working as a reservoir engineer, you come and be like, okay, we need to ch change this choke, choke up, the choke of this well. That's why we're not getting good readings, right? Mm -hmm. Man doesn't want to hear that. I mean, <laughs> now, you want to be able to dig in the data and say, okay, extrapolate, or what's likely going to be the choke? I mean, what signature, what well in this field has the same signature? The same signature, I don't mean just by like one spot on apple to apple, but over the lifetime, if this well has flowed like 10 years, the other well has flowed like 10 years, you can be able to extrapolate, okay, since these guys have the same profile, this is a lot more than likely what the choke set is. You can even dig deeper and be like, okay, what's like the separator pressure, historical separator pressure for that particular well, right? And also for the other one, I mean, you can go as far as possible. And that way, I mean, you're not telling management, hey, I want you to install a new choke, or I want you to spend this extra money, but what? Now you're now working as an engineer um, to make that happen. I have another question. Oh, Absolutely, go for it. 
So, I mean, for handling this kind of data, I mean, this humongous uh, data that is generated on site most of the time, uh, I mean, how do you handle to transfer it to town? Because it's, I mean, now the architecture that is like being handled, I mean, most of the data has to be compressed, so not all the data is going through, right? Okay. So, I mean, nowadays we're yeah. facing this problem, right? Yeah. And your OPEX is going to get affected because, I mean, your operational cost is going to increase too much, right? So, mm -hmm. my question is, uh, which kind of uh, uh, devices or architecture is available now mm -hmm. in order to, like, handle or transmit this data to town from the rig? Okay. From the rig side, because okay. nowadays everything is like compressed and sent. Yeah. Because you're generating 20 gigs and like yeah. it could take maybe 48 hours instead yeah. of uh, of compressing it and sending maybe 10 percent of it and taking maybe two or three hours, right? So I like I like your question, but before I answer, please guys, you can see where I said please fill out the survey. So please kindly fill out the survey just to let me know how I I mean how I did. Uh, just a quick, is is quick three, I think three or five questions for you guys. Feel. But really, I like your questions. You know why I like your question? I like the way you're thinking. You're a, you're a driven engineer. You know, you're thinking about how you can solve problems. So yeah, there are solutions for that, right? So there are two parts, two solutions. I will tell you the lazy solution and the solution I want you to <laughs> go after. Yeah. Um, so like currently like solutions for that. So now they have like all these cloud provider providers. They can provide you like like a small device where you can you know because one right you sending that amount of data to the cloud you're gonna be spending a lot of money communication costs yeah. right. So what you can just put all of them together inside. They have like a device where you like upload all of them and ship it to their um, data center where they can now upload it into if your I mean if your company already has like an account with them they upload it into your I mean cloud server and it's live so they have like solutions for that right now but if you ask me as an engineer right now this year and age I'd rather say it would be good if you deal with the live data so I mean as the data is coming up from the read Right, you're analyzing it, you're figuring out oh, what opportunities. Oh, okay, this rig. I mean, if you work for the rig guys, I mean, oh, how can we optimize setting equipment on the rig that are not doing great? Right? Oh, if you're not working for the rig guys, if you're like a company man, right? Okay, and um, now for this well we drilled, um, what are their, you know, what are their signatures or what are their, you know, I mean, yeah, what are their signatures that I see that we could. I mean, be able to produce more hydrocarbons, or do we see any form of any communication, uh, you know, with any adjacent, adjacent wells and all whatnot. But yeah, I mean, I would say you should do that now. <laughs> but the, what that shows you, what that tells you from his question is that there are a lot of opportunities. Yes. Because that, that one, you, the one about you compress the data, that's an opportunity. That's not so prevalent, right? But yeah, I mean, well, I'll say yeah, uh, do the work with the live data. <laughs> Question. Sure. So, um, kind of picking back on Ming's question. Oh. So we talked about, so you talked about the uh, machine learning and AI kind of complementing the physics. Um, do you see an opportunity where um, this actually changes or gives us room to challenge certain physical concepts that we have as yes. opposed to, you know, I mean, we've been doing this this way, but then you see machine learning actually saying this is actually what it is and what confidence level will you have? Yes. Thank you for the question coming from a PhD. I gotta be honest, me, I mean, I don't have a PhD, but I mean, it's always good when I hear PhD say this. <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> I mean, because, I mean, me sometimes, right, to be honest with you, right, I'd be like, okay, there are seven principles with the advent of AI, now we need to go back and revisit them. 
I mean, we need to go back and revisit them. Because, you know, now they tell you pi is 22 over 7. Right? How did that come about? I believe there must have been like one physical quantity or the other, right? But now with AI, you can actually say you want to analyze that, you want to monitor and analyze that physical quantity for even like a longer amount of time, right? Versus then, it might just be like laboratory or whatever experiments that are, you know, limited. So I see like, in my opinion, so there's this um, kind of very reputable machine learning guy. So I, I think he proved, his name is Jeffrey Hinton. So he, there was a law, an algorithm he had proposed earlier, right, that really was doing great. Then later on, he came out and be like, and he's, he was like, that's not the right stuff, that he thinks we need to go back and revisit it. And the guy is really reputable in the machine learning and AI company. So if we can get, you know, I mean, like more top professors of all those disciplines to say, okay, we need to go back and revisit some of the principles. I mean, that's the honest truth. Because you know the truth, right? I, I gotta be honest with you, when I was, I mean, working as a reservoir engineer, a production engineer, one quantity, physical quantity that was really tough to estimate or to model was gas. Like gas. Gas, really, you don't really, you know, people say, oh, they model it good, but it's tough. Even when you build like compositional modules to be able to like, you know, capture all the different constituents of the gas, it's still tough. So for me now, working with like artificial intelligence algorithm, I see like, I mean, non-linear, I mean like non-linear features. Artificial intelligence algorithms can be able to, you know, be able to like, you know, give you like a more um, robust, a more realistic, I mean, result of what it might be. So something like that, you know, um, yeah. So I see like a lot of the, yeah, a lot of, I see like a lot of um, be like, yeah, I see a lot of big laws, principles, concepts needs to be revisited, you know. Mm -hmm. I see that, I see a lot of that, you know. And to be honest, it's me and you that will need to go revisit it. Because <laughs> this, this, because this, I mean, like, I mean, the guys that established the laws, uh, they won't want you to re revisit it, you know? I mean, they won't want you to revisit it, because, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, I, I feel so. I feel so. I feel so. But, I think what happens most times, the challenge is that, okay, now, right, there needs to be, like, a scientific, you need to support whatever you're revisiting scientifically. And in the science community, whoever has been researching or working on a particular area, it's more knowledgeable of the subject, right, than yourself. So that's where I see like, okay, even if you say you go come up with your, you know, kind of law. Yeah, I think that's the thing, because even when, like you need to be able to support it, and then there's also the question of what goes on in AI, how are you tuning your parameters and certain things? So, like, so how do we as scientists kind of trust this as opposed to what we can, you know, go through proofs? I think that, that would be like the question as we go into the future of this. Oh, that's part of the question. Hi, Rival. Another thing about AI and that is great is that, I mean, depending on the algorithms you write, it could be, it's really transparent. So, there are some black box modules in artificial intelligence, but for the most part, it's more transparent. You know, it's, I mean, and again, that's why I said, okay, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's more transparent. It's not like, okay, it tells you zero point, I mean, Zero point uh, twenty-two over seven is pi. I mean, is this going to you know tell you how we trend that? Is it is it twenty-two point? Is it twenty twenty-one over five? Or you know, it tries as much as possible to be transparent. But don't get me wrong, there are still like black box models. You know, like yeah, something like your deep learning algorithm is a black box module. But that's like 
state of the art right now, you know, the way it generalizes with your eventual model is what makes it like, you know, really, yeah, great. But, yeah, I'm happy you talked about revisiting those concepts in yourself. <laughs> no, not me. me. <laughs>